in the Gaussa savanna lived a family of African wild dogs. They lived in a very close-knit community. They looked out for one another. And most of the time, they just enjoyed their surroundings. They were wild and free, and nobody could rule them or tell them what to do. All of the dogs had their own personality. Lycon was the leader, and his right-hand man, Pictus, made sure to keep all the other dogs in line. The dogs were pretty much free to do whatever they wanted, as long as they reported back to Lycon. One day, Lycon brought his group out to go hunting. Even though they were still in the middle of a drought, there was still enough food to go around, and he was really good at finding it. They would stay pretty close to the migrating herds. None of them had puppies or anything. And as a matter of fact, Lycon had broken off from his main pack. These dogs, for the most part, were not directly related to each other, with the exception of two of them, Kanini and Canada, the two sisters. Suyo had gone with them as well, being an older female, but seemingly the runt of the pack. She had a lot of wisdom to give them, and so Pictus and Lycon found her to be a very valuable asset. Apiete was a rugged hunter. He was specifically unique because he had a shaggier coat than most of the other wild dogs coming from a genetic line of other African wild dogs that had the shaggier coat. And then there was Hunter. So far, she's the youngest of the group. Unlike everyone else, she has not been able to make a killing blow. She usually is very clumsy. She doesn't take orders very well, not because she doesn't understand, but because she fumbles over herself. You see, while the other African wild dogs have very long legs, Hunter has naturally short legs. It's just part of her genetic line. She is much younger than the others, but other pups her age are much taller. Pictus would always make fun of her and basically tell her, you're in the way. Like, you're actually doing more damage than you are helping us. So hang back and then you can help drag some of it back to the den. That's what you want to do because honestly, that's all you're useful for. And even that is asking a lot. He was very, very hard on the dogs, especially those he didn't feel were pulling their weight. Hunter was pulling her weight and she really was trying. Suyu at first was very hard on her, but after she saw that Hunter was having a bad time, her motherly instinct kicked in. She'd had litters of her own. She'd had about two, three litters. They had grown since then. Like I said, Suya is a very seasoned female. She's much lankier and thinner than the others. Her fur is very short, even shorter than the others. And so sometimes she looks like a completely different species. Where everyone has very dark and obvious contrast in the markings on their fur, Suyo's black markings had since turned gray until she looked kind of like a kangaroo tannish color. It was very odd and it made her stand out from the pack, which was completely fine because she thought it a rite of passage in being older. After the pack was finished with their hunt, they went home to their den. Lycon sat down to eat some bones that he had taken home with him. Pictus did the same and they were pretty much best friends, although Pictus more so felt as though Lycon was his best friend. Lycon always held the boss title he would look down at Pictus, but not in a disrespectful way. He just usually kept people at arm's length. He understood what his role was as leader of the pack. So he never thought of anyone as his best friend. Everyone else acted like puppies towards him. Pictus would sit down and eat his bones beside Lycan. Lycan, of course, would pull his ears back and make a chittering high-pitched noise to warn Pictus to move farther away. He was not allowed to eat in the same area as he was eating. It was a sign of disrespect. Pictus would quickly pick up on this however, and shake out his coat and take his bone somewhere else. Meanwhile, Lycon would snap at him in front of the rest of the pack so that they would know, hey, I just put this guy in his place in case any of you are thinking about doing that, reconsider. Lycon was a strapping African wild dog. He also had a darker coat than usual, with tan patches throughout his body and his paws were actually larger than the rest of them. They always joked around and thought he was mixed with some mythical beast, but he was well respected by the members of this pack. When they all left the other pack, that they were a part of, Icon respected the leader there. After all, the leader was his father. As of late, he heard that the leader had recently died and the father's brother, which is Lycon's uncle, had taken over. But Lycon already had his pack and he was happy in the part of Gauso Savannah that was his. Knowing he had a smaller pack though, it would be hard to defend it against other predators or even other packs. But African wild dogs in the area usually were all related to each other. So most of the time they left each other alone. As they went back to the den, Hunter trailed behind all of them, and she was kind of sad. Two sisters trailed behind her and made chittering noises. Kanini had gone up to her first and asked, what's wrong? Like, you've been down lately. Canada would go on the other side and was mostly quiet. She was way more introverted than her sister, but she was always legitimately concerned about Hunter. Hunter would tell them, you know, I feel like I'm not a member of this pack. Like, we went away because we were misfits, or not misfits, but kind of like outcasts, and we escaped 
with Lycon to not feel that way. And I still feel like way. Like there's nothing I add to this pack of any value. And she would say this with her ears hanging low, with her tail tucked between her legs. Canada was just listening to all of this intently, being very shy. Kanini would say, look, when I was a member of the old pack we were from, people used to tell me I was a smart mouth. They would get on my case because I would just speak my mind and just say what I was thinking. And my twin, Canada over here, Canada remaining quiet this whole time, by the way. Yeah, they would get on her because she wouldn't talk enough. It's like nothing you do could please these people. That pack had gotten so big to the point where there were elitists in that pack and it was no longer a family unit. It felt like certain people were entitled to certain things and the rest of us were just chopped organs. Hunter said that she still feels like that now. She said, listen, this is a smaller pack and yeah, you do have to make a name for yourself. Once you find your own kill, you'll be fine. And maybe what you can do, go out there and try to hunt some smaller stuff and get your game up, girl. You'll be fine. Don't worry. Everyone grows on a totally different level. I would never steer you wrong. So hearing Kimmy say that Hunter felt better and she said, you know what, that's a good idea. They went to the den and they slept that night and everything seemed fine. Hunter had a new lease on life. She decided that tomorrow she was gonna go out and try to hunt. So the next morning was particularly hot. The sun wasn't even all the way in the sky and it was burning up. Hunter was annoyed by this. She was like, Jesus Christ. I mean, we're in a drought right now and we have a little stream that's close by our den that was quickly drying up, but it honestly was mostly muddy water. And because it had gotten so small, there were crocodiles in it, and that was the only piece of water they had for miles, so they decided to all live there, all 30 of them all packed up into this water. It was impossible to take a drink without your tongue touching one of these crocodiles, which was very dangerous. And honestly, the risk was almost not worth the reward. But Hunter decided to go out anyway. She was like, you know what? I always keep putting things off, let me go out. So she walked out and she was stopped by one of the African wild dogs. It was Lycon and he got up and rose to his full height with all four legs, shook out his coat and he pointed his ears forward and intently looked at her and asked her, where are you going, Hunter? Oh, I'm just going to hunt, she replied. Without the pack, he responded because it was pretty weird to him why she would just be going off alone before the sun was highest in the sky. Well, to be honest, she said, you know, I just feel like I'm not respected and I understand why because I haven't really brought anything to the pack. So I was gonna go out and catch my own stuff. And what were you gonna do with it? He was asking because he had a problem with her doing her own thing. Because if she started doing that and the other dogs of the pack saw her doing that, they would start doing that. And before you knew it, the pack structure would just completely fall apart. He said, look, your problem is not you hunting little game. It's learning to work with a pack. If you wanna be a lone hunter, then go on ahead by all means, but you can cannot be part of the pack. We don't do things on our own. You have to learn to work as a structure or else you are completely useless to us. Hunter didn't see it that way and she said as much. She didn't see the problem with bringing in extra food if she was doing it by herself. Lycon explained to her that that was complete nonsense because if she utilized what little energy she had left chasing after very small prey, she would not have any energy and they did actually have big game that was going to give them more of a profit or a return to hunt that and help them. Hunter wanted to tell him that, well, I don't feel feel useful anyway because you know I, I just you know I've been told that I'm less useful than I am and to stay off to the side. She ended up telling Lycon this and he started growling and got very very angry and he asked her did I tell you that? She would sheepishly reply no and when he asked her who did and she says well Pictus has been saying that then he folded his ears back and asked her is Pictus the leader? Do you take orders from him? Well since he's under you yes she replied. This made him very angry and he held his head back and let out a call similar to that of a coyote. Pictus came running. Every single one of the dogs had their names. So it, when they made a certain noise, that would basically be the dog's name. And Pictus came running. He was asleep, but leader says I should come, he came. And Pictus looked in between them. He was wondering what the heck was going on. And when Lycon confronted him about what he said to Hunter, Pictus would be very confused and look at Lycon's face. He had since learned to read the face of Lycon just in case he knew he was angry, he would not say certain things. He gotten attacked or reprimanded as a result of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. So he said, sir, uh, she endangers our efforts when we're hunting. So yes, I did say those things because she needs to pull her weight more. Hearing this, Lycon basically told the both of them, look, from now on, you take orders from me. Pictus, handle everybody else. I clearly need 
to give you direct orders because what has what's been happening is too confusing for you. So Hunter told the two sisters, Kanini and Canada, what had happened, and they said this was good news. At least maybe the leader will work with you. But this just made things worse. Apete would end up making the final blow for the kill. But this specific hunt that they did later that morning ended in disaster. Hunter would do exactly as the leader had told her to do, which was to flank the creature. When the antelope ran the other way, she was supposed to just stay off, like way off to the side just to keep running and leading it towards Apete. When Apete was on it and he clamped onto the antelope's throat, the creature looked like it was going to kick and hurt Apete, so Hunter did what she thought was the best thing to do. She ran ahead of the twin sisters. Both of them were like, what are you doing? Hictus was about to bark an order, but then he looked back at Lycon and Lycon was looking dead at her and barking orders to her, asking what the heck she thought she was doing. Hunter ran up to the antelope and tried to bite it on its haunches. As a result, the antelope reacted by stopping shortly and throwing Apeate off. Apeate landed wrong on one of his feet and sprained it and the antelope got away. The dogs were all tired because usually they would chase their prey for quite a while, but the drought has been so bad that they had to reserve all the energy that they had. Suyo ran straight to Apeate and asked if he was okay. He got up, shook out his shaggy mane, his coat, and he was limping. He went straight up to Hunter and attacked her and started swinging her back and forth by her scruff. Icon quickly broke this up by attacking him and growling at him and both of them had a face off. She almost killed me, he would say. You let that happen. Even though his paw was hurt, Icon did not care and he immediately corrected Apeate's attitude. Apeate sauntered off, his shaggy coat blowing in the wind. Hunter felt just awful and when she saw Lycon strolling up to her with his heavy footfalls in the dirt, she knew that she was in trouble. As soon as he got over to her, she did that guilty thing that dogs do where they put their ears back when they're about to be submissive to the alpha, put their tail in between their legs, and she basically lay down on her side, but she didn't do it fast enough. Lycon ended up snapping at her and biting her on the muzzle. She let out a squeal of submission and pain. He yelled at her saying, didn't I tell you not to do that? I deliberately told you to back off and it's like you were not listening to what I was saying. You're a horrible listener. You don't take orders and that's why you're a horrible hunter. Why is that even your name? As much as her friends supported her, they were even frustrated at what she did. Suyu walked by with her tall frame and she looked down at Hunter and she said, girl, you need to get it together. You're not a puppy anymore. And this is a life and death situation now. We can't keep exerting ourselves like this without food and with so little water. It's going to kill us. Then she went over to a Apeate and put her body up against him to help him walk. He quickly shoved her off, but Suyo put her body back up against him and she's like, let me help you, bro. Stop acting like that. I don't need your help, he would say. And he was just very finicky and cranky and that was just his personality, but he did relent and allow Suyo to help him. Hunter was left lying in the dirt. She sat up on her hind legs and just stood in that little sitting position. And as they left, she just felt so small. She still felt like a puppy. Not only was she the smallest member, but she was totally totally useless and she cried. That night Hunter would leave from the den just all by herself and go out into the savannah. She was so depressed she just didn't know what else to do and she went by the crock pit. The water was almost non-existent to the point where you could actually see the top portion of the crocodiles now making up most of the surface area for that little river or a little area, little stream that had now become a very tight pond. The crocodiles were also getting very aggressive with each other, but the water wasn't water anymore. It was just mud. And she went close to where they were and basically just sat there and looked at them. And she just wished that she would be useful. She just wanted something to happen. And she saw something in the distance. She was like, what is that? And she saw some, some figures on the horizon, but not directly in the horizon, just like many yards away, about 30 yards away. So she snuck by herself, looking back at the den to make sure nobody was following her and decided to check out what these figures were. So when she went up to a tree, she stood behind it with her head held very low, her body was slinking low, much like a cat, and just tried to investigate what was going on. And those two figures 
were two male lions. These two male lions looked as though they were related, at least to her, because all lions look the same. But she was wondering, why would lions come this far? It's very odd. Like, they know that this territory is usually, like, our territory and the leopard's territory, because the African wild dog kind of shared a territory with some leopards that were in the area. So it was very peculiar. Maybe the drought caused this. She was aware that the drought makes animals act differently. So she didn't want to alert the den. She went closer to the lions to try and figure out what was going on. And they kind of understood the language that the lions were speaking. Because when you're in the area long enough, you kind of understand other creatures, especially predators, that you have to depend on. Or, or either for food, for scavenging, or that you were directly in competition with. And as she listened to them, she realized that her pack might be in danger. The two lions, who were actually cousins, were talking about the drought. They were talking about collecting from the different territories. This really worried Hunter, and she was trying to be quiet and wondering how she could tell the rest of the pack. But as she backed up, one of her hind legs stepped on something, and a twig snapped, and the two lions quickly whipped their heads in her direction, their eyes glowing in the dark. Hello? Panthera asked, out on the wind. Knowing that the lions would most likely come after her, Hunter just ran. She picked up her four legs and just ran, her ears planted to the back of her head, just freaking out. And she could hear their feet coming after her. She just knew without looking back that the lions were coming. She found these two rocks that were kind of leaning into each other that formed a very tight crevice. And she hid in the crevice of those two rocks until morning. And eventually, the night saw its way out. And the morning made its way in. Anyway, as it was morning time, Hunter didn't even realize that she had fallen asleep. She looks around, she didn't see the lions, and she immediately just books it for the den. She's out of breath by the time she reaches. She looks behind her, can't see the lions. And Lycan is there waiting for her along with the rest of the pack. And he is livid. Before she can even say anything to him, and as he's about to chew her out where he's like, where the hell were you? The twins were just coming out of their den too as they saw her arrive. But before she could say anything, guess who they see prancing towards them on the horizon? The two lions, Panthera and Leo. Panthera strolls up to the wild dogs and all of them by now are standing outside the den. They're all like standing at attention, just waiting to see what's gonna happen, especially Suyo who really doesn't like lions. So Panthera just yawns lazily. He's not even threatened by these dogs who are chittering and growling. And he's like, how is everything? And he basically says this. The drought has been very taxing and it's the worst that we've had in my lifetime. You know, everyone has to do their share and... My cousin and I, Leo, are responsible in this region at least for rehabilitating the environment in the midst of a drought so things can move along. Lycan would growl and step in front of the rest of his pack. Their heads were all bowing low as though they were ready to attack or defend their den at any moment, especially Pictus, who was his right-hand dog. He side-eyed Pictus, basically telling him back off, and he stepped in front of him to let the lions know he was the one in charge. What's your point? He asked them. Panthera would continue. Well, everyone has to do their share, as I said. And I've noticed that you... And he kind of did that motion where he kind of turns around 360 and looks around with his head as if to add a little bit of dramatic exaggeration. And he continues saying, Have a bit more game on your land. So here's what's going to happen. Just so we can move the ecology along, your responsibility is to deliver payment by killing 7% of what you have and leaving it out for us so we can spread the wealth. Leo is glaring at them and just wanting one of the dogs to make a wrong move, to twitch, to move too fast to do something because he had ripped a few wild dogs and hyenas in his day. He was known as the hyena killer and he was surprisingly good at killing these little creatures. He just wanted a reason to hurt one of them. Suya recognized this. As much as she hated them, she backed up a little bit. Pictus looks over at Lycan and Lycan is looking straight at the lions. He does not like this. First of all, the lions come in his land, demand of him, and embarrass him in front of his pack. So bravely, he lowers his head like a guard dog, and he growls and says, that's not gonna happen. Leo is like, have you lost your damn mind? He threatens him and takes a step forward, and at this point, they're so close to each other, the disparity in the sizes between these two creatures is so ominously obvious. Lion is growling, Lycan is growling, and both of them almost fight. Suya really 
realizes what's gonna happen and she basically jumps in front of them which almost causes Leo to attack. She quickly cries out, please, please. What happens if we don't? She asks the lions. Oh, well, that's simple. We'll kill you and take your land anyway. I'd rather not have to do all that work. So if we can avoid that, that would be wonderful. Leo just laughs as though this is funny, knowing the dogs can't do anything. Suyo says nothing. And as the lions are waiting for a response, Lycan speaks up. He is still ready for a fight and he steps his front off forward and says that they will fight them. To which Pinfero replies, Oh, how cute. You do that. And confidently, Panthera and Leo saunter away, their tails wagging to and fro, and walking confidently, knowing that the wild dogs aren't going to do jack. Most of the time, the pack is fighting over what to do and planning their hunts frantically before the lions come back to collect. They're just an all-time stress high. All of them are just barking at each other. Fights are breaking out. They're very, very stressed. A Pante would say, if we continue bowing to them, they're just gonna take more and more, and you know, they just want us to fail for an excuse we have to prepare defenses suyo says they can kill us anyway we better appease them they won't be as motivated to kill us canada of course is just quiet through the whole thing and at one point she does try to speak up to say something but everyone else is just so much louder than she is and she's so introverted that she's like oh whatever just doesn't say anything. Kanini, however, is very outspoken and the loudest of all of them. And she agrees that they should appease the lions, but this cannot be a long-term thing because it's just impossible for them to keep this sort of uh, activity, hunting for the lions and then hunting for themselves in the middle of a drought. They, it would just kill them. It'd be too much, which is probably what the lions are betting on. Having nothing to contribute, Hunter goes with her initial plan. And later on, after they're arguing, she tells the twins what she's going to do. So they tell her, oh, you're gonna go out and and you're gonna hunt like you said oh we've got your back Canada tells her to be safe she nuzzles the both of them or basically does like a nose touch which is their way of hugging sort of and they say they'll cover for her as she goes out hunting and when she goes out hunting she finds a jackrabbit hunter is actually having fun and she is giving chase this jackrabbit that she found and the thing is just flying pell-mell and she's actually keeping up with it but then something haunting happens the jackrabbit's running fast she's running fast what catches her attention is there's something in the distance to her right that is keeping pace with her. Like something is running alongside her a distance away through the tall grass, blends in with the tall grass, and she's like, what is that? What is running as fast as me, right alongside me, far enough away, like it's trying to hide? That's very peculiar. And it's so ironic because she is in the middle of hunting and it feels as though something is also hunting her. She then looks to her left after hearing a noise and she sees something else also keeping in pace with her. So these two things on either side of her several yards away in the tall grass keeping pace with her. She realizes to her horror after there's a little bit of a clearing through the tall grass as she's running that it's the two lions. They quickly start closing the distance as they're running alongside her which terrifies her. By now the jackrabbit is long gone. It doesn't matter because Hunter is no longer interested anyway. The hunt is off. She has no recourse but to run straight for the crocodile infested pond. She can feel the two lion's jaws on her haunches. And right as Leo leaps in front of Panthera and snaps at her, Hunter ends up leaping right into the pit. The lions just watch her for a moment and she sees her head quickly turn in the direction of some dog noise. Before she can process what's going on because everything's moving so fast, Hunter is dragged to and fro and then eventually down into the mud that was actually deeper than she thought. She is just covered in crocodiles and all she wishes for in that moment is for everything to just go back to the way it was, where there was no drought, where there was an abundance of water, and to where she could be a decent killer and actually help her pack, where she didn't feel useless. Then she feels herself sinking and drowning deep in the mud pit, until there's nothing but darkness. Back at the den, Lycan is asking the twins where Hunter is. And after she hasn't been home for a while, they finally tell him what she wants to do and that she was only trying to help. Lycan is infuriated and they're all sent out to search for her, except for Peyote, who was told to continue resting his leg. This guy is always ready for a fight. He's always ready to defend his pack. And even though he's been injured from the last hunt, he is still willing to serve the pack. However, as soon as he gets up and he's like, okay, let's go, 
this is like not you. Lycan quickly agrees and says, yeah, with you being our best hunter, you're too valuable. You need to be in tip top condition. Anyway, when the rest of the pack walked over and they walked around, they were calling out for her. When they finally found her, sadly, they saw her in the crocodile pit. Suyo just could not believe this. And when they all saw her and saw the crocodiles all around, every single one of them came to the same conclusion that she was dead, that she had actually ended her life on purpose. Pictus actually had a theory and thought that she was actually desperate for water and so she wasn't strong enough to hold out like the rest of them and it was actually a blessing to the pack that she was gone. When they all went back and reported to Lycan on what happened, he actually looked saddened by the news and when the rest of them went to their dens and just tried to chill out for a while when they were not around or in his presence, without looking at Apeite, he turned to him and said, I failed her. a beautiful vision under the water as if an eel or some aquatic creature is swimming through it. It glides over elegantly the many different areas under the water as if traveling across space and time using the water as a medium. A highly peculiar alien entity with four wings at the base of its head makes it look like a flower when they completely open up and a fishtail swims up to whoever is having this vision and starts talking. He asks, What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. Well, I suppose... If you're willing to pay this high of a price, maybe, just maybe, we can let this one slide. After it is revealed that the person who's having this vision is Hunter, who wakes up on the bank of the pit. She chokes out the water she had swallowed. She pretty much just came back from the dead. She's so scared and she looks over to see if there are any crocodiles, they're still there, and they're completely gone. And the reason why they're completely gone astonishes her beyond her wildest imagination. She's not looking at a muddy pond any longer, in which the 30 crocodiles could barely fit, but a small lake. By this time, Hunter's jaw dropped open. It's still pretty much considered a pond, but it's so big, especially to Hunter, that it would probably take her around five minutes to swim from one side to the other. Creatures that she's never seen before, at least have not seen for a long time, start coming over to drink the water. The crocodiles poke their heads out and seem so relieved to have all this water that they're not even interested in the creatures. Again, Hunter has no idea how this happened, but she happily, after admiring all of this, goes back to her family and they're just so happy she's alive. Lycan is just astounded, like everyone is making much of her. Pictus is standing by Lycus. They're like, wait a minute, I thought you were dead. Kennedy goes up to her and is just running and doing that play bow thing that dogs do. And she's chittering and licking her mouth and wagging her tail like a puppy, saying how happy she is that she's okay. How is she okay? Canada leaps up on her back in the most extroverted show of affection she's ever done to Hunter. And Hunter is just loving this. She licks them in return. Suyo smiles and says, praise Jirate, while Apeate is just dumbfounded. When the dogs go on their next hunting trip, unfortunately, Hunter gets confused once more. They are successful with the hunt but she made it more frustrating for them and herself. When she had gone to lie back in her den, she just kept feeling sorry for herself. After they got back from the hunt, the rest of them did anyway, Suyo came back and she laid inside her den with her and encouraged her. Hunter didn't want to talk at this point and just lay down on her tummy with her ears twitching back and forth, listening to all the sounds around her. She would look at Suyo from the side, but just didn't want to talk at all. So she just sat there and apologized and just went quiet. So Suyo said, listen, <laughs> what happened with you, child? That, that was impossible. Possible. You came back from the dead, and if you can come back from the dead, then you can do anything. At that very moment, Lycan came back and he was very stressed. He said he had met with the lions while Hunter had been MIA, which was about two days, and they had changed their mind and wanted a set price. At check-in time, the African wild dogs were now expected to leave five bodies of antelope worth of food, and the lions claimed it was only fair since they were a pack. Apete had been so angry at this, and he was like, what does he think we are, made of stone? Suya rolled her eyes and she says, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we're struggling just to catch one. They all argue and say there's not even that many game on their land as the lions even think. So what are they supposed to do? Just materialize?
fertilized antelope and prey from out of thin air. As Hunter was listening to them, she just closed her eyes and wished so heavily that there would be more creatures and that they would have more prey and just that they weren't having these problems until they heard a cracking sound under the earth. Immediately, all the other wild dogs stopped. And as they looked at Hunter underneath her, water started spreading out from her and the other dog kind of laughed thinking she peed herself. Canada covered her face with her paws out of embarrassment, out of secondhand embarrassment for her. But as Hunter got up, they discovered that a fountain had basically opened up right underneath her and some water was leaking out. Suyo was just jumping around and praising her idea of a god. Peite could not believe it and was like, you know what? Canada led the group and started just digging and all the other dogs started digging alongside Hunter and Canada. And in less than an hour, there was a small pool right by their den. The pack would soon realize that it was in fact Hunter that was making the water and so she went by the watering hole and tried it again whatever she was trying that feeling that she had and the more she tried is the better it got the better she got at generating what they now realized was water which is what she was responsible for they all watched in awe as the big body of water started getting larger and larger until there was essentially a 50 foot lake of fresh water in the area animals more animals started coming over and that little territory the african wild dogs lived in was the most prolific, like an oasis in the savanna. The region became so abundant, they actually had more food than they knew what to do with. Lions wanted to know what the hell was going on. So Panthera and Leo were talking to each other. And Leo was like, do you notice how that little area with those stupid bitch dogs has been getting more abundant and green? And he says, yes, but they have not given us our payment. What is going on with that? Leo agrees that they're asking for ass whooping. I think we need to tear a few legs off some bodies. So the lions made made their way to Lycan's pack, his den, straight to their den. The lions thought enough was enough and they came and attacked the African wild dogs and tore up their dens. The dogs fought valiantly, but the lions were very strong and kept batting them off. Even still, Lycan led the attack against the lions, refusing to give up his den, refusing to give up everything they'd worked so hard for. Pictus was right on his tail, attacking everywhere he needed cover, but it was Apete who was the strongest fighter. He got knocked off and got slammed into a rock and even with his injured foot he charged after those lions. His fur was so long and luxurious that as he was running towards those lions they looked like little licks of flame. He leapt onto Panthera and held onto his nose to start shaking vigorously and Panthera used his very large claws and batted him away while he was getting assaulted by the other dogs. But Leo was the brawler. And when he immediately went after Leo and attacked him on his back, Leo started bucking, trying to bite and claw at this dog that was on his back. At first, he could not get to him, and Apete was being so aggressive and moving like clockwork around this lion that Leo was actually getting frustrated. Being thrown off once more, Apete landed on his back and recovered quickly by rolling onto his four legs. He stopped himself by lowering his front end to the ground and placing his hind legs firmly in the ground. As his whole body skidded backwards, his claws digging in and trying to find purchase. Determined, with his hair sticking up and his ears pasted to the back of his head, his teeth bared, he charged again towards Leo. Immediately, Leo opened up his two large paws and quickly took down the warrior. He sunk his huge feline teeth into the African wild dog and thrashed back and forth like a dog with a chew toy. All this time, Leo was laughing maniacally. Apete opened his mouth because that's all he could do. At the moment, he was kind of being suffocated, so as he opened his mouth to try and let out a call of pain and agony, nothing came out. His friends watched helplessly as Leo bit into him. The rest of the pack had to retreat. Lycon was so, so sad and upset because he didn't want to risk any more of the pack, he called them off. Losing their best warrior right now was a death sentence for them. With blood on their mouths, Panthera and Leo shook their coat out and refluffed their manes. Panthera said, the next time, you might want to think a little longer than five minutes at what you're next move is going to be when you think about attacking us. We want our food like we said. And with that, both lions walked away. I mean, the dens were destroyed. The lions were so strong, they were able to chip and crumple a whole bunch of the rocks that made up the pack's den. But that wasn't their primary concern. Apete had fought valiantly, and now he was too injured to recover. His guts were hanging from his body. The two sisters hung their heads and wept. Suyo especially, who saw Apete as a little brother or a son. Icon was 
despondent, and it's the saddest that anyone's ever seen him. Even through all of this, Pictus was a bit jealous and would look at Lycon, wondering what was it about Apeite? Yes, he could fight, but so could Pictus. He just thought it was kind of ridiculous. That the only person Lycon seemed to show emotion for was his lovely warrior. But Pictus understood from a logical standpoint why Lycon would be concerned, because, in fact, he was their best hunter. Apeite is the one who dealt the killing blow whenever game was on its last 15% of stamina. Now he was gone, which would make acquiring food even harder. But it's not like they had to worry, because Pictus remembered, well, this is a very abundant area, so we can just catch food next time anyway, with little to no effort at that. Lycon hung his head low, his tail was hung low, he was just so dejected and despondent. He lay beside Apeite, understanding that there was nothing he could do for him. Apeite couldn't even speak, he was just gasping for air as his guts were just hanging out on the dirty ground. Lycon had tried to nuzzle them back into the body, but every time he moved them, they just got worse, more dirty, and he just realized, yeah, this is the last time we're gonna see him. Lycon lay beside him, and the rest of the pack sat there whimpering as Apeite slowly died. And when he finally passed away, Hunter was so angry that she went out, and the sisters both went with her to confront the lions. Hunter had tried to fight the lions as well, but she kept getting thrown off, and she had a few scratches where they had connected with her. As she caught up to the lions, they turned around, realizing that she, they were being followed, and Panthera says, where's our payment? Hunter bravely stuck out her chest, the smallest of this pack of African wild dogs, and said, no more. Leave us alone. Don't ask us for anything else. This is our land and you are not welcome to it or its resources. She lowered her head in determination. Pictus had caught up to her. Sisters vaguely saw him loping towards the area because he was wondering what was going on. And he watched firsthand as the puny dog hunter stood only feet away from a charging full-grown lion. Leo was more massive than Panthera. He was definitely the muscle of the pair. But when he needed to cover distance, Distance, he did so elegantly, effectively, and terrifyingly. Sisters were terrified, but they were prepared to fight, even though they knew that they would lose if the lions caught them. Hunter didn't realize her eyes were closed, and when she opened her eyes, Leo was right in front of her with his paws outstretched and rigid as though some force was holding him back. She heard a pittering sound and when she looked under his body, she saw blood pooling. And the wound that it was coming out from had a huge spiked root sticking out from it. Panther was angry and charged after her, but as soon as he did, a dozen more of these spiky roots came shooting up from under the ground. Both the sisters, Kanini and Canada, slowly turned their heads to look at Hunter. They were a little bit in front of her and on either side of her and they slowly turned to look at Hunter. And they were actually terrified because they understood that she was the one that was doing this. Leo died right in front of her, still impaled on this root. And as Panthera saw this, grudgingly and with narrowed eyes, not even putting two and two together that it was probably her doing it, thinking it was just cursed land, Panthera left immediately. Later, the pack buried a Apeite and they sang a song of reaping and saying goodbye. The two sisters and Pictus told Lycan what had happened, but he didn't believe it. After a few months, the ecology of the African wild dog territory became wealthy with plant life and animals and seemed to be the only area not affected by the drought as they had a constant streaming fountain, actually several of them by now. They had gotten so popular that the pack of wild dogs that they had been a part of came to the territory and begged to join their pack. Lycan's uncle was so proud of Lycan, and at first he wanted to be the leader, but Lycan said that this was his territory so it's only fair that Lycan be the leader of the entire pack or they could just all leave. The rest of the pack was not accustomed to hearing this because you gotta understand Lycan and his friends were the bottom of the totem pole at the previous pack that they came from. So all of a sudden hear him making demands and being in a place of power was very odd and disrespectful to a lot of them, especially those that were much older than he was. Surprisingly, the uncle agreed and Lycan became the leader of a pack of over 40 African wild dogs, and every one of them had heard the myth about the goddess dog blessing them with water. Of course, the sisters wasted no time and told them that it was Hunter, and when they did this, they all laughed. The horrible part was when Hunter would try to prove it to them, her power no longer worked, but it didn't matter to her. Well, one of the elites had heard that story, and because he was superstitious, he actually believed it. It 
gone up to Hunter and introduced himself, and his name was Torbet, and the first thing Hunter thought was, man, he is really freaking handsome. Like, one of the most handsome dogs she's seen, and he was one of the elite. They all looked very pretty, but he in particular just had a very distinct look about him. And he would fall in love with Hunter, but not really fall in love, but he was infatuated with her and thought that she was blessed, like she had these powers. And he said it would be his honor to have this female, Hunter, bear his pups. And because Hunter was so smitten with him, of course, she obliged. When Hunter became a mother, she officially became part of the elite group so she could speak for a lot of them, or at least speak to them as part of the elite group. Lycan, of course, was a leader, but the elite group acted as though he wasn't a lot of the time. So now that Hunter, who was a little bit older now, was officially part of them, she would stand up and give a speech on the sandy rock and say that from now on, Lycan would be the ultimate elite dog and should be treated with respect. As a matter of fact, all dogs in the pack should be treated with respect, from those who have no kills to those who have hundreds. She definitely agreed, or at least toned down the social justice after Lycan told her, you know, the ones with more kills should still be honored. And she said, you know what, you're right. However, if we're a team and we're pushing hunting as a pack, then everyone matters. Instead of pulling others down, we should try to encourage them to be better because whether you like them or not, they're still a member of this pack. And if the elites don't want any more people breaking off to forming packs on their own that will be competition later, they'd better start treating them better than they treated Hunter and her friends. And nobody, as she said this speech, said anything because technically she's an elite. Even her mate was like, shrugged his little dog's shoulders. He was like, it is what it is. Hunter and Torbet had little puppies and Hunter happily raised her kids. And in this large pack of African wild dogs, she was one of the best, most nurturing mothers there ever was. One day, as her pups were playing nearby the den, they were playing with a little rock and it rolled over a sprouting plant. One of the little females told her brother, hey, go get it. The other female said, yeah, hurry up. And the little male ran over to get the rock. All right, I'm coming, he said to the others. And as he went up to the rock and he rolled the rock off the plant and he realized that the plant was crushed, he looked at it for a moment. And then instinctively, out of nowhere, for no real reason that he could even understand himself, he placed his tiny little paw right in the dirt next to the root of the plant. Actually, part of its root was even sticking up. It was a very tiny plant that had barely begun its life. The little pup closed his eyes and then the plant quickly stood up rigid and brand new as if nothing had ever happened. And he picked up the rock in his mouth and ran back to play with his siblings. The end.